Welcome to Sprinkle with Hope podcast and your host Shane. Today our guest Heather Moise gives so many amazing insights into how to improve yourself and do the things that you've always wanted to do. Hopefully you listen to the very end. She gives an amazing story right at the end. Heather unpacks a lot of stuff for you and hopefully you listen to what she has to say. Oftentimes we are the limiting factor into why we can't do something. And she gives some really good nuggets. Please listen in and get something out of this. I know you will. But here we go, Heather Moise. Welcome to the Sprinkled with Hope podcast. Welcome to Sprinkle with Hope podcast and your host Shane. Today, our guest is Heather Moy. She is a four-time Olympian in the bobsled, has won gold twice in 2010 and 2014. Um, so not only does she do bobsled, she's uh, been in rugby. And uh, as far as I know, she's been the only Canadian female to be inducted into the World Rugby Hall of Fame. So amazing work Heather's doing. Above all that, she's an author and we'll talk about her book, Redefining Realistic, and she's a speaker. And then she has done a ton of humanitarian effort. And so Heather, thank you so much for joining us today. We're super excited. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> so uh, let's see, where do we start? <laughs> um, you've you've been a few or we've interviewed a few olympians and so i always like to ask that takes a lot of effort and a lot of hard work and dedication and and to be an olympian for as long as you were how did you do that what what motivated you to to keep pursuing that yeah i was i feel like i was very fortunate that i actually didn't start my kind of Olympic or even kind of, uh, I guess, elite sport training or even lifting weights, like taking sports seriously and actually even lifting weights until I was 27. So huh. that was kind of, I was starting when some people were burning out and getting out of it. <laughs> um, so it's, um, it's a bit of a different situation. And I think that by starting later, I had already done so many different things. I'd already lived in other countries and done work in a developing country and, you know, had was almost finished my master's degree. And it was kind of a, uh, I was able to come at it with a different perspective that um, I'm actually now able to use with my clients. So coming into sport where there are so many pressures and there could be so many different, um, yeah, I guess societal expectations and pressures on you. I was at a point where not only am I like a redhead, so there's a little bit of ingrained stubbornness <laughs> there, but also just the seeing a bigger picture. Sometimes when you're so in something, you don't actually see the bigger picture and what the consequences could be for pursuing something that might be doesn't align with your values or mm. you know, different things. So I was really able to come at it with a, I guess, a valued centered approach knowing that I was not compromising, you know, what I really wanted to do and doing something that I wanted, but not because society thought it was cool or important. And so kind of making decisions a bit differently. And so um, I guess part of it too, is that I didn't just have one sport. So that might sound crazy because it means that I was doing so much more, <laughs> Right. but it kind of was able to shift my focus. So I was you know, able to take that little break from bobsledding. And I mean, I didn't really have an off season because the off season for bobsledding meant I was doing rugby and the off season for rugby meant I was doing <laughs> bobsledding. But each one provided me with different stimulation and different focus and probably also helped my body in the long run because I was doing very different things. Like with bobsledding, if I just did that, it's very linear. There's not a lot of side to side or lateral movements. So I think that's sort of, you're also with different people, different atmospheres. Right. And I honestly think that that kind of helped me be able to enjoy it longer and feel different, you know, spread out the pressures and <laughs> keep them in perspective. <laughs> I love, I love that. And I, I think that that is true that I think having different perspectives and, 
and being able to see it the way that you did probably really did help you, you know, through, through your career. So how does somebody like yourself get involved with bobsledding? Like, you know, did you just up and how one day decide? Really yeah. <laughs> good question. It is just a good question. <laughs> Um, I was personally recruited. They do have, um, kind of testing combines that go okay. through different, you know, major cities and stuff. Um, and, and now they sometimes have these big testing things where they might identify athletes and link them to a sport kind of based on their strengths, kind of pull them and say, you know mm, what, you okay. could at this or this, do you want to try one of these? Um, but that wasn't the case for me. For me, it was, I was recruited. Um, the, I got a random call about a year after I graduated from my undergrad and it was from a track coach from a different university, not the one I had attended, <laughs> but a different university, but I, his track athletes I had competed against. Oh, so, okay. and we had also done some training camps together with university. So I knew, I knew Dennis well and well, well enough. And so he called me out of the blue and he just said, I've just been asked to do recruiting for Eastern Canada. And you were the first person that came to my mind. And I think you would be perfect. You have the ideal combination of strength and speed. And I was like, Bob, like who does, who, who does that? Who does that? <laughs> so I said, no, I wasn't interested. And he said, what do you mean? Like the Olympics are less than a year away. I know who's in the program. Uh, you would be going for sure. You'd be an Olympian. And so it was at that moment that I realized that it had always been a dream of his to go to the Olympics, but mm -hmm. it hadn't been a dream of mine. I grew up in an academic family. I played sports for fun my whole life, but we never really watched it on TV. So I never elevated what it would be like to be an athlete. Or, I mean, in terms of representation, you weren't seeing many women on TV anyway, doing sports. So I always cr considered sport to be extracurricular to what I was going to do to earn a living. So my dream at the time had been to work in a developing country. And I had just accepted an internship to do, to work in Trinidad and Tobago, um, okay. as a disability sports program officer. And I'd always wanted to do that. And I was so excited. And so I wasn't giving up a dream. I was still pursuing my dream. I just wasn't pursuing his dream or what mm -hmm. society would have thought as being, you know, more important. And I ended up living in Trinidad for almost three years and moved back just to do my master's degree in occupational therapy. And one year into that program, I actually ran into that same, I ran into Dennis at my former track coach's retirement party. And he was like, I can't believe you didn't do it last time. Um, I know you're older now, so it'd be a lot harder. Mm -hmm. He said that. And, <laughs> wow. and he said, I know. And he said, but I still think you could maybe do it. Like, I still think there's a chance. And I was just like, oh gosh, Dennis. Okay. Just send me the information. Just here's my email. Just send me the information. <laughs> and anyway, I finally agreed to, to do just the testing camp. Cause I'm like, okay, I'm not really going to do this but testing doesn't commit me to anything cool right. experience, whatever. So I agreed to do the testing. And, but then when I found out the dates for testing it overlapped with rugby nationals. So I contacted them and I said, look, it's not going to work out because it overlaps. And the, the development coaches in Calgary said, well, how much would you miss? I said, well, I'd miss the whole first day of testing. And they said, well, that's fine. As long as you're here for the rest of it, I think, you know, based on what Dennis is saying, I think it's okay. Now, fortunately for me, I missed that first day of testing because that was all weightlifting and I've uh. never lifted weights before. <laughs> and I would not have told them that I didn't know how to lift weights. I would have just watched other people and tried to copy them and probably would have crushed myself with a bar. But, <laughs> but anyway, the next day was all speed work and plyos and like power, like explosive power and like sprinting through timing lights with a weighted sled and Anyway, still tests I'd never done before, but at least it was in my wheelhouse. Like I wasn't going to crush right. myself or whatever. So I was like, okay, this is really weird. Disconcerting when the sled feels like it's an inch away from your heel and whatever. But anyway, I did it. And I ended up breaking one of their testing records. Wow. So I was like, wait a second. You mean to tell me I've broken a record amongst all of these people who have been training for years and who are supposed to be representing us at the next Olympics? which were five months later. And I was like, I wonder if I can do it. So I hadn't seen a sled, hadn't been down the track yet. Cause there's no ice on the track until October. And so at the end of August, I'm like, can I learn a new sport? Can I learn to do it well? And can I learn to do it well actually in time to represent my country 
in five months at the next Olympic games. And so I fell in love with the challenge. It had nothing to do with the sport. Wow, I fell in love with awesome. this challenge and it was like, okay, worst case scenario, I have a, a ridiculous story to tell for the rest of my <laughs> life, you know, trying this new sport, but that's, uh, yeah, that's how it started. That's amazing. And how it ended is four Olympics <laughs> after that, two gold medals. That's yeah. amazing. So I want to talk a little bit about your book, Redefining Realistic. Uh, it was released in 2017. And I love, love what it's about. It's talking about living with life with purpose and really recognizing, re recognizing our abilities. I'm curious, Heather, why did you write this and talk about that a little bit? I think, especially now, both as a speaker and, you know, as a coach, and that book was really important for me. A lot of it was going through my own thought process as I, as I was trying to get it down on paper. And I think I am so passionate about people not selling themselves short mm -hmm. and breaking free from the often self-imposed limitations of boundaries that have been set for us or that we have set for ourselves. And that boundary is usually... I mean, we feel like we have the freedom of choice, which, which we do, but we tend to choose just within the boundaries of our direct environment or our direct exposures. And so career paths, um, different life, like relationship or lifestyle choices or different, um, just different opportunities, different experiences, different ways to live your life instead of just the, what everyone in your neighborhood, how they lived growing up. Um, it's, I, for a lot of it is it's one, not selling yourself short and two, realizing at the end that there are different ways of doing it. Not everything has to be done the same way. So with a master's degree in occupational therapy, it was kind of pulling in a lot of my, my training on, I mean, what I loved about being an occupational therapist was that you could, I could help my clients see their situation, whatever it was, post-stroke, you know, traumatic brain injury, whatever, to see their situation in a different way, different perspective. And so that they could see the possibilities that still exist, regardless of whatever mm. challenges they're facing. So, um, I mean, everybody's gonna face different levels of challenges and some people are gonna look at one challenge and be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they, they could ever get past that. And then that person is thinking, oh, this isn't actually really a challenge at all for me. Like something else is a challenge. And yeah. so it's all a matter of perspective. And I think sometimes we need that outside assistance sometimes, that outside kind of check um, in order to, kind of question our assumptions, start challenging our self-limiting beliefs and start kind of addressing some of those fears that are holding us back because they no longer serve us. They're usually based on, on stories and, and stuff that we've been telling ourselves since we were kids. And so really, if you think about how many things we assume that stop us in our tracks before we even get started on things. I mean, I grew up in a, the smallest province in Canada. You know, it was... Um, it's only accessible by, you know, a 13 kilometer bridge or a flight. Uh, it used to be a 40 wow. minute ferry ride when I was growing up. So, I mean, we were somewhat isolated and I mean, it, it's a decent size Island, but I mean, we were still isolated from the rest. So it's my neighborhood or what I was exposed to directly. Um, that's what you think. And for me, I mean, Olympians were TV people. Right. Not everyday normal people like I considered myself to be right. because nobody else around me was doing that. So those were just those people. Those must be special people. And now I know that they're not special people. They're just everyday normal people. And so it's all those people we see and those those professions that we see or those careers we see are just people who chose to pursue that career, maybe in spite or despite of the environments that they grew up in. So it's pretty it's pretty remarkable. I just think that we have to learn how to deal with the naysayers um, and whether they're external or whether it's the voice in our own heads. Um, and we need to start questioning, questioning them and putting kind of them in their place and re-empowering ourselves to actually make the choices that are important to us. I love that. I love everything you just said. I think it's really important. Shane and I have said very similar things, um, you, you know, to our listeners out there that, that we are our own limiting factor, right? We limit ourselves by putting these fears and other things in our life that don't belong. Um, so my question next is kind of, um, so 
here you are around all these really top performers, right? These super great athletes. Is, is that different than being around, like you say, the regular society? I mean, are, you've got these people who have these things that they, maybe they do have fears of running down a tr- icy track and, but they're doing it. They're doing it anyway. Is there differences between being around those top performers or, or others that you've seen? Um, do you mean in terms of how they um, address their pursuits? Or right. Do you mean just in general, right. in terms of interaction and in terms of. Yeah. Like, like really, do they, do they have those same limiting factors as say, you know, others that aren't, you know, those top performers? I'm, I'm sure some of them do. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure some of them do, but they probably wouldn't admit it because that then makes it real. So, um, gotcha. So some of it's limiting factors, some of it's like self-efficacy issues, like whether they can actually do this or not. Some of it is um, self-esteem issues, uh, like a whole bunch of things that are usually rooted in something that was said to us as a child that we have clutched onto for dear life as though it's, you know. Um, Now that being said, I can actually tell you something that I know for sure. My my teammate, and I write about this in my book with her permission, I, I wrote about this in our book. Um, my teammate for my very first Olympic games, um, Helen Upperton, she, uh, we did three races together, I believe three or four, can't remember three or four races together that winter leading up to my very first Olympic games. And in our very first race together, um, at the bottom, there was, there was so much joy and so much at like one of the coaches was crying, so emotional and just couldn't believe it. And I was like, well, we came third. Like we didn't, why, <laughs> what I'm, am I like, what am I missing here? And I found out later that Helen had already been competing for a few years and she had never broken the top eight before oh. broken into this, you know, into this lower pack. And I was just like, okay, well, that's great. I'm glad I was a part of that. That's awesome. Um, but in looking at that, I realized that sometimes ignorance, ignorance is bliss. Oh, and I say yeah. that because I actually had no idea. I mean, we set a push start record and we were all of a sudden the Germans are videotaping how I'm starting, even though I wasn't doing it the right way, according to community <laughs> coaches. And so they're trying to figure all this stuff out and ignorance is bliss because I did not know that we were, I never, it never actually, it all happened mm. so fast. Right. And I'd never, we hadn't grown up watching the Olympics. We hadn't elevated that like the Olympics were that was this thing. We were just racing to maybe try and get there. So it never once occurred to me that we were all that we were racing against other Olympians or world champions or, <laughs> or Olympic champions. Like it just never even occurred to me. To me, they were just a bunch of girls from different countries who might have had different equipment and maybe ate something different for breakfast that morning. Like to me, <laughs> right. it was just I'm competing against other girls. So we're on the same, like, you know, we're we're going to all go for it the same way. And so it wasn't until later that I found that out. And it was like, oh, but then I already ended up having this proof (laughs) of kind of normalizing everybody else on Mm. on the team, whereas someone coming into it saying, oh my gosh, I'm racing against so-and-so and and I'm racing against so-and-so. That is how you elevate the stresses, the pressures, the, that's where Mm. mistakes happen, all of that stuff. So For me, sometimes when I'm working with people, not even athletes, but people who have to do like a huge important pitch or like doing something that's performance-based, that's something your whole career could ride on or something like that. We actually work a lot on downplaying the importance of that event, of normalizing that, of it's the same as playing rugby game. Like why is there a big team cheer saying, this is the game that matters. This is the one game. This is the, you know, whatever no, this is just a rugby game. It's the same. If you play as well as you've played in every other game in order to get to this point, you should be fine. Like you should, it's, it's as soon as you get past that, it's like the bell curve with that um, Mm -hmm. level of, of arousal or adrenaline or whatever you want to call it. And if you get past that peak and your adrenaline is way too high, that's where mistakes happen. That's where things shut down. That's where you do things that you wouldn't, you're like, Whoa, I, what, I've never done that mistake before. Why would I ever do that? Right. And then it's the same on the lower end. You just don't have that kind of excitement, that energy, the adrenaline to get to actually get your performance. So there's that peak level. 
And people just have to figure out where that is in order to perform. Mm. But that being said, like when we got to the Olympics, it was the same thing. I had not elevated the Olympics because I didn't grow up watching and dreaming about being there. For me, I was like still trying to prove myself that I deserve to be there. Like I literally was so focused on doing my job and trying to execute and earning my spot and earning my place and like trying to figure out the equipment, trying to figure out what my driver would need in order for her to perform well, in order for me to like everything that it was really just going through. And we missed after four runs in bobsledding. So they don't pick the best run. They add up all four runs. So adding that up, it's, it's a uh, 5.7 kilometers. So 3.54 miles. And we missed standing on the Olympic podium by five hundredths of a second wow. after adding up all of that time. So it was, um, and we had set, set push start records on the first day and we had done all that stuff. And anyway, so it was just like, at the time it was like, oh my gosh, fourth place after five months of my life of training, that's not too bad, you know, not too shabby, but that is also fourth place is unfinished business. And five hundredths mm -hmm. of a second is the definition of so close yet so far away. Like you're either a medal medalist or you're not. And that is where we were sitting. And so it wasn't until a couple of years later when they started doing advertising for the next Olympics, which were in Vancouver. And their, their theme was believe. And they interviewed my former teammate. They, they interviewed Helen and she was on a commercial and I just saw her pop up on TV and it said something about believing. And she said, um, I do believe now, but in the last Olympics, I had always dreamt about being there. I had always admired Olympians and, and I got there and I felt like a fraud. I felt like why I'm just a normal person. How can I, how can I actually be competing at the Olympics against all mm. these other people? So she elevated everyone else who deserved to be there. And she kind of minimized her, what, what she had achieved to get there. And she said, so I didn't actually believe. And so is belief worth five hundredths of a second? is belief worth six hundredths of a second? Is it worth not like, where does that, does it come in the form of a hesitation? Mm -hmm. Does it come in the form of a, you know, just, it's, it's a strange thing to think about. But when I heard that, I was like, why, why did you not believe when all I was seeing was we're competing against the same people we've competed against all year. And when she and I were paired up together for those three or four races during the world cup season, we had always meddled. So for me, didn't occur to me that it wasn't a possibility to medal. Whereas her, she wasn't even thinking about those other things. All she knew was that we were at the Olympics. And so, yes, I definitely think that, that there's a lot, there's a battle, like there's imposter syndrome, feeling a bit like a fraud, um, things that creep up and all of a sudden break, like that breaking point of stress and pressure. And that's where we hear about people who kind of fall off or, or crumble under the pressure and, and that sort of thing when, that's the mindset piece. Like mm -hmm. we often hear about it's 10% physical, 90% mental. Um, I only agree with that when it's at the elite level. Um, when you're going through puberty, there's obviously 90% difference in physical. <laughs> Let's be serious. <laughs> no, and at puberty, there's only 10% going on in the brain. Like there's not a lot going on up there. So it's yeah. not, yeah. but when you get older, it's probably a 10% variance in, in people's physical abilities physical abilities to execute what they're supposed to execute when you're at the elite level and 90% of it does end up being mental. So if you're a two out of 10, for example, and you're still up there, you're still in the elite level, you're still a, an amazing athlete, but if you're about a two and you're competing against someone who's a nine or a 10, if you have the mental ability that capacity and the mental fortitude within that 90% to put that in perspective, to not be intimidated by that other person who's there to literally focus on the execution of every step that has to go along the way to get there, to not blow things out of proportion and to aggrandize a situation. Um, and the other person in the stead is, is thinking who's a nine out of 10 or a 10 out of 10 is like, what if I screw up? What if my sponsor mm -hmm. is going to leave me? Um, how are people, people are going to be so disappointed because I'm supposed to be, I'm number one in the world. So what if I thought, you know, what if I don't do well? What if I, and then they're literally performing out of that 90%, maybe only 20%. So yeah. I definitely think that there is a struggle there. And most of it is a, the mental one and being able to put things in perspective. And sometimes it is mentally putting on a cape and being like, yeah, I'm amazing. 
I deserve to be here. <laughs> and whether you're pretending or not, right. sometimes it is stepping into the role and adopting the, the characteristics and the um, those things that, that will, the characteristics that will allow you to do what you want to do. And it's so good. Yeah, yeah. I, I really appreciate everything you said. And I think it can be applied on all of our, all the aspects of our life, not just an athlete or yeah. somebody who's going for that, but that, that stuff in our mind creeps in mm -hmm. and we tell ourselves, oh, we can't do that. And it's five hundredths of a second off from what we wanted to accomplish. So love, love that insight that you just gave us, Heather. So we're, are you prepared for the double down dose? <laughs> So this is, this is a, I what don't we, know. <laughs> we, we, we love to do this. Uh, it's two basic, difficult questions that we have. And we ask all of our guests. So the first question of the double down dose is how would you define hope? Ooh, how would I define hope? Oh God. <laughs> okay. um, I warned you. <laughs> Yeah. Do people stutter and stammer as much as they, I Yes, right every <laughs> single guest. Good. I wouldn't want to let anyone down here. Every guest. Um, could you imagine if I just stouted off this like elephant? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Hope. Um, how would I define hope? I guess hope is... Hope is when you're wanting something to happen. Um, hope is when you're really, really wanting something to happen and putting all of your mental energy into making that happen. Mm. And maybe a little bit, it is wanting something, but instead of acting on making it happen, wanting the universe to, to kind of have a, have a part in it. Because hope, as I love hope, but it is a little bit pat. It's you're you're sitting there hoping for something to happen. So, but I think that that oh, but that's actually hoping for something to happen. I don't know if you give hope to someone. If you give hope to someone, if you don't mind me analyzing this, go for it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we love this part. I, <laughs> oh yeah, I bet you do. Um, okay, if I think if you're giving hope to someone, that's a little bit different. Hoping for something is different than providing hope to someone. And when you provide hope 100%. to someone, I think it is it is shining a little bit of a light on the possibilities that they could potentially create for themselves. Love that. Yeah. Like, cause those are different, right? When you sit there just hoping for totally. something, sometimes I'm like, you can't hope you have to act. Yep. You mm -hmm. can't just wait passively for something. But when you say something that all of a sudden gives someone a little bit of hope, like show you show them a little minuscule of potential you you shed light on potential that they have which gives them hope to achieve like to the, to take things to another level or to change their life in some way or to yeah those are two, those are different <laughs> those are different yeah. no we, we love asking these questions and and most of the time you, you know the guest will say afterwards like uh, now i'm going to be thinking about it all weekend like, I what, know. what does hope mean you know, my actual answer is going to come like tomorrow right in yeah hour <laughs> And I can be like writing it on the bathroom. Wall. Like what? Yeah. Well, shoot like, us Shane, a message. I'd love to hear. Yeah. You're like, Shane, I have a, I have your answer. Here it is. <laughs> I'd love to hear it. No, we, we love asking these questions. And so the second part of the double down dose is just as easy of a question, yeah. but maybe a little bit more difficult. <laughs> and, and that is, what is your definition of love? Ooh. Uh my definition of love is probably something super eloquent, but right now it's just going to be, <laughs> um, I think complete acceptance. Um, complete acceptance and unconditional Yeah, uh, completely unconditional acceptance 
for exactly who you are and what you what you represent what you, like everything every kind of fiber of you being i think that's love again so so awesome to get insight from all of our guests on these two simple yet so difficult questions to answer <laughs> uh, we we yeah. really really love it because we we're all about hope and providing the world with more positive energy or whatever you want to call it we want to provide those people anybody who is willing to listen heather thank you so much for your time today this has been truly uh and an awesome experience for me and uh, thank you so much for your insight and all the things that you're working on and doing to help the world you're so welcome i feel like we're just starting no yeah. <laughs> we done that? <laughs> we'll have you on again okay <laughs> we will no, this has been a real yeah. joy. Uh, um, and maybe, maybe just some last parting words about, you, you know, you know, what, what would be some advice you could give to somebody that you haven't given us yet that if they're listening and they're like, you know what, I'm stuck in a hole and, you know, I'm not going anywhere. You know, what's maybe some last parting words that you, you have for, for those out there listening who, who may be going through a difficult time in their life and like, Oh, I don't, I'm not even sure what to do tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of people um, go through these, not even phases, but they get to a point where they feel stuck or unfulfilled, or, you know, some people have these goals and dreams that they've had for years, and they're just gathering dust in the back of their brain, because every time it comes to the forefront, it's whatever voice that is, or whatever thing that comes that just shoves it right to the back, that's, that's that that's what has to be addressed. And usually it's a, oh, I don't have time for that. Or I'm, I have too many responsibilities for that. Or, oh, I'm too busy. That's never going to happen. Or, you know, now I have kids. So, or, you know, I can't leave my job. So like all of these in their minds, legitimate reasons, but really they're either excuses or they are just things that have to be worked around. So my, what I would love is for people to just whenever they have that shutdown thought or that shutdown moment, what for whatever that is, is for them to just question their assumptions, question their assumptions because we assume way too many things. We assume we don't apply for that job or that promotion because we assume we're not qualified enough or we don't apply, do something else because, oh, so many more people are gonna apply. Well, maybe they're thinking the same thing. Mm -hmm. We don't ask that person out on a date because they're obviously beautiful. I'm obviously attracted to them or whatever. So they're obviously taken when maybe nobody else is even talking to them because everyone's thinking the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, we, we shut ourselves down so much. And for me, I want people to start questioning their assumptions. And if they need kind of a couple of questions to help them do that, one is asking them, are you sure? One is says who? And another one is why not? And mm -hmm. if they can kind of grab onto those three questions and just kind of like, are you sure? That's a question I asked my mom um, when she was talking about a bucket list. Do we have time for this little anecdote? Yes, yep. absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, this is years ago. This would have been the summer of 2016. I was visiting my parents. And my mom kind of burst into this room. And I, I tell this sometimes in my keynotes because I really find that this anecdote is, the story is so relevant because it's so every day. Mom comes into the room and she's like, I, <clears throat> she's like, I, I'm just, I just want to tell you that your dad and I have added something to our bucket list. And I was like, bucket list. Okay, super surprised they had a bucket list. But anyway, <laughs> really curious. So I said, okay, what is it? Your dad and I have decided that one day, like someday he and I want to, ballroom dance like ring in the new year ballroom dancing in the imperial palace in vienna and i was like okay that's a legit bucket list goal like that is a legit okay so i said oh my gosh that's amazing are you going to do it this year she said oh no we can't do it this year and i said oh what plans do you have this year for new year's eve oh no nothing we don't have any plans this year but we can't do it this year well why not oh well because heather it's such a big deal like it would be sold out by now mom, are you sure? And she's like, well, Heather, it is, a, it's televised. It's like, you know, celebrities and royalty go to this thing. Like it is a big deal. It's huge. Like, <clears throat> I'm sure it would be sold out, but did you check? Like, are you sure? And she said, well, no. So of course I get my laptop out and within five <laughs> minutes, I find the exact event she's talking about. And I'm like, mom, 
there's still tickets here. Do you want me to just book a couple tickets for you guys right now? And she did look a little nervous. She was like, whoa, whoa. Uh, okay, uh, okay, are we doing this? Like what? And she said, well, it would be more fun to go with another couple. And I was single at the time, so it wasn't going to be me. So I said, well, what about my Aunt Roberta and Uncle Alex, with whom they had traveled to Germany the year before, had a great time. Mom said, oh, they would be so much fun. It would be perfect to go with them. But they're not going to be able to go this year. And I said, oh, why not? Well, they're doing their trip across the Northern Passage this year. They're doing that over the Christmas holidays. Oh, no, they're doing that in September. But they're not going to want to do two big trips in a year. And I said, are you sure? And so she kind of smiled. She said, you call your Aunt Roberta. So I called my Aunt Roberta, told her this whole bucket list scenario. And also that mom didn't think they'd be able to go, but just wanted to put it out there. And then Roberta kind of listened to the whole thing. And she's like, well, I'll run it by your uncle, but you know, just tell your mother that we'll get back to her. Okay. At that point, there was nothing else I could do. So then we sat down to eat less than 10 minutes later, my aunt Roberta called and said that they were in. So that winter, that winter, less than six months later, the four of them went and they rang in the new year ballroom dancing in the Imperial (laughs) palace in Vienna. But the amount of assumptions that literally every step of the way would have stopped them in their tracks before getting there was remarkable. It was incredible. And so every, like when people hear that story, they're like, Oh my God, like how many times do we assume something Mm. and it stops something before even it gets started? So it's pretty, it's, it's pretty remarkable when you can kind of challenge someone like, why not? Or says who, or are you sure? Are you, no, like, are you really, did you look, are you really (laughs) sure? Or do you just think? Yeah. Oh, and I mean, if we looked it up and it was sold out, fine, no big deal. Right. But, but if you don't challenge that, you will never know. So that's what I wish for people. I wish for people to start challenging their assumptions so that they can break free of these, these things that are holding them back and actually, enjoy their life and, you know, live big. And yeah. that's awesome. Great story. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Wonderful advice to end on again, Heather, thank you so much for your time Been truly, truly grateful that you were able to join us. So thank, thank you. you. This has been great. Thank you.